Breathing in, I calm body and mind. Breathing out, I smile. Dwelling in the present moment, I know this is the only moment. That's a little piece there by uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, who um, I kind of consider my teacher of 30 plus years that I most likely will never meet. And if you're ever interested, go check him out. It's Tick T H I C H, not N H A T Han H A N H. He's a little uh, Vietnamese Buddhist who I have followed for, like I say, almost 30 years now, and uh, he's currently in uh, France. But the reason I probably will never meet him is he's in. He had a stroke several years ago. He's in his upper 90s. But anyhow. A lot of times when I talk about be here now or here and now being in the present, people kind of jump to the assumption that I'm talking about Ram Das, the, the famous book that turned 50 this year, Be Here Now. And while I love Ram Das, in fact, I can't tell you how many um, audio talks I listened to his over the weekend, my kind of thoughts, concepts of Be Here Now originally came from uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, and that was also the foundation, the simplest foundation of my meditation practice. And it was sort of kind of kept me going for years and years before I even started meditating for periods after I started meditating, didn't meditate anymore. And it has just been something that I've been able to uh, go through um, throughout the years. I've talked a good bit about mindfulness um, lately, or I've done a few videos, and um, it's just something that's really a big factor in my life right now. You know, it's just really trying to focus on the now because you know, for a number of reasons, like, you know, I'm living, I'm currently living with an old college roommate of mine. And sometimes, and his brain, he, well, he wasn't a drunk for 30 years. Sometimes he'll actually remember like a play in a football game. And this is like I said, like when we were roommates was at least 35 years ago. And, you know, I, I, this comes up all the time where like somebody will tell me something we did and that memory was totally gone. And even as they're retelling it, I know they know, I can just tell because I know the person telling it or the source that I'm reading knows what they're talking about. But as they're telling me about this thing that I participated in over, I don't really have firsthand remembrance of it. So the point being, when we look back to the past and speculate on what was, what could have been, or feeling guilt over what we've done, um, it's, the past doesn't even exist. And now I'm not trying to be silly there. I'm being a little, you know, I'm taking a little bit of liberty of words, but what I mean is the past doesn't really exist as a concrete thing. We have different versions of the past. Let's say if five of us um, were together 25 years ago at an event and five of us sat down and just wrote down our thoughts, just freehanded wrote down our recollection of the event. That would be five different events. Does that mean that somebody's lying? No. Does that mean that somebody's wrong? No. It just means that our memory is distorted over time. So, you know, even when we're going back, we don't, we're, even when we're thinking about things in the past and lamenting over them, they're not always exactly even as we remember them. And the future. Think about this. I was thinking about this like I, it used to happen when I was going to a new country, you know, and maybe I worked for several months. I used to do that. I used to bartend wait tables for, you know, about eight months during spring break all the way past Labor Day. And then I'd go bounce during the winter and go find somewhere. And I traveled a number of places. I've traveled in Europe. I've backpacked in Europe for a year and a half or so, off and on at different times. I've lived in Costa Rica, spent a couple of months in the Dominican Republic. I've spent time in Jamaica. In other words, I bounced around. Not one time, not one time out of any of those trips did I, like when I got there and you know, wherever I ended up living or staying at the time, the kind of food I was eating, the people I was around, what I was seeing, it was never like I imagined it. Never like I imagined it. So past is distorted. The future is just an imagination. So the only thing that we really know is that here and now, and I don't mean just the present as in present day. I'm talking about in this very moment, that I'm sitting here making the video and that you're sitting there watching the video. And the simplest way to always just bring it back, just bring it back, just bring it back. That's why even when I'm talking about meditation, I'm not focused on how long you can stay, you know, with your mind just centered in, not thinking about anything. It's about coming back to that breath. It's about coming back to that in breath, out breath, here 
on the in breath, now on the out breath. And um, yeah, that's just really, really the only moment that we live in. So that's just something that I'm really focusing a lot on these days just to really reinforce this. And to, even though I talk about this a lot, um, it's still something that's a daily work because we're human. Now, I'm not telling anybody they shouldn't think about their past. I'm not, you know, chastising anybody for even being guilty or going back into their past. I do it myself. Hell, like I say, I've had some heavy karma coming down on me from like over the past few years, just redoing all the shit in my head, thinking about all the years that I was just, like I said, a worthless drunk that just, I did nothing of substance, but it's always a work in progress. And I had a couple of um, little short pieces I wanted to share here with you. Actually, one is really, really short. It's just basically a little poem. Um, but let me read them, and I will do my absolute best. I've been getting better about doing this to drop uh, the links to uh, this article. The article, the other one is just like a little poem, but the article I'll drop in the description below. And it's, uh, it starts out, Samu. S-A-M-U, training the mind to stay present. Meditation in the midst of activity is a thousand times superior to meditation in stillness. Zen master Hakuin Ikaku. And you know, I'm going to stop for just a second before I read. I totally resonate with that because a lot of times, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll meditate here or my roommate knows I meditate and I'll go in and I come out or sometimes he doesn't know I'm in my room meditating and I'll come out and he's been making noise and he says, oh, I'm sorry, I was making noise. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. If you have to go find absolute still just to get find the stillness within you, that kind of defeats the point. It's about finding um, in, the, in, the, in that activity. It's about finding that calm place in that activity. So Samu is work practice, meditation in the midst of activity. In Japanese Zen monastery, Samu involves the work of keeping the monastery clean, the monks fed, the buildings and grounds maintained. One, can cons one could consider it a break from the rigors of Zazen, or sit in meditation. Or it could be one of the most challenging, challenging and rewarding meditation practices available to a sincere practitioner. As a Zen Buddhist in the 1990s, I loved all aspects of the meditation experience. The little Zen garden with the cherry tree leading to the Zendo, the persistent call of the wooden Han signaling it was time to enter the Zendo or meditation hall. The clean wooden, uh, the clean wooden floor lined with brown meditation cushions. Chanting the opening and closing liturgies, cone practice, the stories and Dharma talks about ancient Zen masters. But Samu was something else, not formal Zazen and not merely doing chores. It was neither and both. Doing Samu, one could get a glimpse of what life might be like for a Zen master, where the line blurs between deep meditation and doing mundane things. As Layman Pang, a Zen Buddhist from the 8th century, wrote, My daily activities are not unusual. I'm just naturally in harmony with them, grasping nothing, discarding nothing. In every place, there's no hindrance, no conflict. My supernatural power and marvelous activity drawing water and chopping wood. What separates David Layman Pang and any other person doing chores? My guess is that Layman Pang was at one with whatever he did, never resisting nor clinging to whatever reality presented. Such supernatural power is what we call ordinary magic in the Shambhala tradition. Ordinary magic is when the heavy veils of ego and discursive thought disappear and nothing separates the self from the exquisite nature of reality. Why now? Surely Layman Pang understood that life's most precious aspect is found only here, in this present moment. Moment by moment, we have the opportunity to, to experience life 100%. In glorious 3D technicolor surround sound. Now is where it's at. Now is where life happens. In a sense, it's all there is. Yet we humans get quite creative and avoid in the present moment. Life can be boring, painful, repetitive, or ugly. We may wish to be anywhere, anytime, except for here and now. We habitually filter our experience through thick overlays of memories, ideas, preferences, opinions, fantasies, daydreams, worries, plans, hopes, and internal dialogue. Consequently, at the end of the day, we often wonder where the day went. Then we do it all over again. Being creatures of habit, the patterns of living in our heads, strategizing, rehearsing, what-ifing, 
become deeply ingrained and we hardly even notice the constant churn of, con of concept running through the mind day and night. Chogam Trungpa Rinpoche referred to it as discursive thinking, which can be defined as passing aimlessly from one subject to another. The mind rambles and digresses or hops excitedly from topic to topic like a wild monkey chattering in the wind. The antidote to avoiding the present moment is obviously to stay present regardless of the circumstance. Simple and yet so challenging. Wisdom traditions from many cultures teach meditation as a way to work with the wayward mind, as a path to enlightenment. Meditation is how humans train the mind to stay, just like we train a puppy to stay. With the ability to stay present, we can fully bear witness to life in all its comedy, tragedy, drudgery, and majesty. Then we can experience the whole catastrophe, as Sorba the Greek would say. Meditation and mindfulness. Meditation is a means to tame and train the mind. It, it can also be an end unto itself, abiding peacefully in the present moment. Sitting on a cushion or in a chair, the meditator places the mind on an object such as the breath. That's what I do. When the mind rests on the object or anchor, that can be called mindfulness. When the mind wanders, awareness brings us back. With this process of meditation, the practitioner strengthens both mindfulness and awareness. Just like a distance runner builds a base through running regularly, meditators build a base of meditation practice. Eventually, the mind settles more easily. I can attest to that. Habits of mind become more apparent, giving the meditator opportunities to choose which habits to cultivate and which to discard. Over time, one who meditates can enhance powers of concentration, present moment awareness, and mental clarity. Consistent meditation allows one to extend the benefits of peaceful abiding meditation into the daily activities of life. If sitting med meditation requires effort and discipline, meditation and action demands much more. This must be why Zen Master Hakuin declared, meditation in the midst of activity is a thousand times superior to meditation in stillness. Samu offers a way to skillfully bridge the gap between formal meditation and everything else. I've been grabbing hold of that kind of stuff lately, like um, on my walks. Like on my walks, you know, I tend to put my headphones in and listen to podcasts. But sometimes on my walks, I just like to stop, turn those podcasts off. And like the other day, I was just tuned into some birds or whatever happens to be going on in the park right now. So just think about that. Just that one takeaway out of all that that I just shared is just take about it away that life happens in the here and now. If that has to become your mantra, say it over and over. Write it on something. Put it on your refrigerator. But life happens in the here and now. I hope you all enjoyed this one. And I will see you here again uh, midweek. Peace and love.